We have to start now. Good morning. Yes, Gongal. Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. I am Janendra Gongal, Senior Public Health Officer, WHO Regional Office, Southeast Asia, based in New Delhi. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you in today's webinar on zoonotic influenza organized by Asia Pacific Quadripartite One Health Group. Inclusivity, diversity, and equity are ideals of Asia Pacific Quadripartite One Health Group. Even influenza serves as a mother of One Health movement in our region, and it is one of the focus areas of Quadripartite Partnership. Now, I would like to invite representative of Quadripartite Partners in alphabetical order. First, I would like to invite Dr. Kachin, Regional Manager, Emerging. Center for Transmount Animal Diseases, ECTAD, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, Regional Office of South Asia uh, for Asia and the Pacific. Thank you very much, Dr. Gongol. I, I was wondering actually why uh, FAO has to give the remarks first, and now I know it's by alphabetical order. Um, greeting to everyone and welcome all to the Zoonotic Influenza webinar organized by the regional quadripartite uh, subgroup on Zoonotic uh, Influenza. Um, I understand it's it's a bit hard to greet everyone uh, by countries, basically because this webinar is open to all. But looking at the uh, time uh, in which this webinar is organized, I, I can safely assume perhaps that most of the participants are going to be from Asia and the Pacific region, because this might be too early for our colleagues from Europe and maybe too late at night for our colleagues in American continent. Um, I wanted to start by um, recognizing our quadripartite partner organization who are supporting uh, and co-convening this webinar uh, starting, of course, uh, from FAO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, my colleagues there, the United Nations uh, Environment Program, uh, or UNEP, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, the World Health Organizations, both the Regional Office for Southeast Asia, CERO, and the Regional Office for Western Pacific, WIPRO. Uh, of course, uh, my um, colleagues from the World Organizations for Animal Health, uh, both regional representation for Asia and the Pacific, as well as the sub-regional representation for Southeast Asia. For those of you who are wondering, quadripartite is supposed to mean four, but why am I addressing six organizations here? Basically because some of our quadripartite partner organizations actually have multiple offices uh, operating in this region. Um, Asia actually has been experiencing various stages of zoonotic influenza uh, in the past two decades. If those of you who are old enough uh, to experience this uh, together with me, you would understand that at the early stage of um, outbreak of zoonotic influenza, uh, we were in the stage of panicking, basically that's in early 2000. And then after that, uh, the stage of wishful thinking uh, that eradication may be possible due mainly perhaps to the trade implications, particularly in the animal sector. Then we revert into our traditional methods of control, particularly also trying to look at the options of controlling diseases by vaccination, which uh, has been proven uh, a bit of a challenge, certainly. And then, um, of course, in early uh, 2011-12, we came to realize that we're not just dealing with a few um, influenza strains, but actually multiple strains, which has continued to evolve. Uh, then entering into the stage of most uh, mostly very fatigue uh, from dealing with zoonotic influenza for so many years. Despite our fatigue and diverted attention to other um, pandemics, such as the COVID-19, of course, and the uh, monkeypox, which has been circulating recently, uh, zoonotic influenza is still here with us and even caused more damage uh, globally. Uh, and you will hear from, from our colleagues in WSO and WOA in terms of uh, global and regional situation of zoonotic influenza later. As the Asia and the Pacific region is still a hotspot for zoonotic influenza, the disease will continue to stay and pose significant fear to poultry farmers 
as threats to poultry production uh, and to all of us as a potential next pandemic, of course. And in the past more than two decades, um, Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, has been supporting member nations to strengthen their capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to animal and zoonotic influenza, as well as other animal health threats. And just last week, uh, FAO organized the global consultation on highly pathogenic avian influenza, bringing experts from all over the world to discuss various topics related to uh, AI, including latest updates related to uh, HPI epidemiology, ecology, and evolution, challenges and new approaches for surveillance, diagnostics and vaccination, and strategic uh, technical guidance for HPI prevention and control efforts. Hopefully, some of the key outcomes from the global consultation last week may be shared as well with um, people who are attending this two-day webinar. So the two-day webinar hopefully will provide a platform to share country experiences related to surveillance, vaccination, and outbreak management in different settings. I also hope that this webinar will be useful to everyone and serve as a reminder that while we have come a long way and have demonstrated so many successes, we still need to continue to work together among different sectors, disciplines, and stakeholders. If we would stand any chances not to repeat what we have experienced with COVID-19 in the past three years, uh, as well as the, with other, another potential pandemic, including influenza as well. And I wish this webinar success uh, and hope uh, participants enjoy the two days uh, webinar that uh, the Quarry Party is organizing. Thank you very much. And back to you, Gongo. Yeah, thank you, Katshin. Uh, uh, definitely, it was not uh, by chance, but poultry outbreak is a major uh, problem in the past and which has socioeconomic and public implication. Uh, and now uh, we also understand that uh, wildlife is also uh, affecting uh, wildlife migratory birds. They are also uh, playing important role in dissemination of avian influenza viruses. Uh, now I would like to request Ms. Marilyn Nielsen, Deputy Regional Director, Regional Office of the United Nations Environment Program, Bangkok. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this regional quadripartite alliance for One Health webinar on synodic influenza. Today, we come together to discuss a critical issue that affects not only the Asian Pacific region, but the entire world. As we all know, the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution and waste threaten our quality of life, livelihoods, health, and well-being. These crises have had a dramatic effect on the emergence and spread of zoonotic influenza, as we've seen in recent years with the increase in high, highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks reported in wild birds and poultry. It is important to remember that whatever happens to nature will also affect our health. When we destroy and degrade biodiversity and ecosystems, we undermine the web of life that we as humans also depend on and increase the risk of disease spillover from wildlife to humans. In times of crisis, like the, like the pandemic we have just gone through, there's a risk of shifting priorities due to economic, health, and social shocks that take away attention from investing in protecting nature, which is a core aspect of working on One Health. Through initiatives and actions to build back greener and better in our world and in, to, to build back greener and better in our new normal world, we have an unprecedented opportunity to transform our health systems as well as our as well as our economies towards sustainability and scaling up the adoption of one health approach. To holistically address the spread and root causes of zoonotic influenza, high and surveillance and emergency preparedness are just as important as redressing ecological imbalances that have given the rise to the threat in the first place. Restoring health to the world's ecosystems, including wetlands and landscapes among flyways of migratory birds will be an essential aspect of the struggle to reduce human vulnerability to emerging and resurging diseases especially zoonotic influenza. 
at UNEP, my organization, we specifically aim to strengthen the environmental dimension of One Health and collaborate to address the challenges of the human, animal, plant, and ecosystem interface. And we recognize that no one sector can achieve success on its own. To secure human, animal, and environment health, we need to break out of silos and foster an even more partnerships and collaborations in the region and across the world. I'm confident that this webinar will provide an excellent platform for fruitful discussions, sharing of information, lessons learned, and best practices in the region, looking for synergies and strengthening our collaborations related to zoonotic influenza and One Health in the Asian Pacific region. Once again, a warm welcome from UNEP, and we look forward to your active participation in the webinar. And with this, I would now like to hand it back to Dr. Gongal, Chair of the session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, uh, for highlighting the importance of holistic multidisciplinary approach at the human, animal, plant, and uh, environmental interfaces. And we can use this not only for zoonotic influenza, but also climate change and other problem we are facing. Uh, now I would like to request Dr. Jessica Kayamori Lopez, technical officer uh, at the W2 Regional Office for the Western Pacific, Manila. Thank you very much, Dr. Gongo. Good morning, everyone. Good moment, uh, distinguished participants, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this quadripartite zoonotic influenza webinar and also to be part of its organization. Uh, this is an important discussion and I'm glad to see us all together to improve and address common issues related to it. And uh, as our colleagues from FAO and UNEP have previously mentioned in their opening remarks, zoonotic influenza is caused by influenza viruses that primarily affect birds, but can also infect other animals such as pigs, horses, and even humans. And these viruses can mutate and spread between species, potentially leading to a global outbreak or even a pandemic, a word that we have been frequently using over the past years. Um, in the past, zoonotic influenza has caused serious public health emergencies, such as the H1N1 pandemic in 2009, which infected millions of people worldwide and resulted in significant morbidity and mortality. In addition to that, zoonotic influenza can have severe economic consequences, such as the loss of millions of animals due to culling during outbreaks and also affecting food availability. Um, WHO acknowledges the complexity of national governance and the importance of a good multi-sectoral coordination and collaboration between stakeholders, including um, the involvement of actors working towards zoonotic influenza. Um, as zoonotic influenza is a serious threat to public health and also requires vigilance and proactive measures to prevent and control its spread, by working together and taking the necessary precautions, we can reduce the risks of zoonotic influenza outbreaks and protect the health and well being at the human animal environment interface. It is also important for governments and health organizations to closely monitor and track outbreaks of zoonotic influenza and take swift actions to contain them. And there is a lot of work to be done. The COVID 19 pandemic has impacted many areas of our countries. And the pandemic has shown a light on the intrinsic relationship between food production, food safety, the environment, zoonosis, and human health. This means that challenges faced may be best addressed by taking a coordinated multi-sector approach, such as the One Health. The coordination and cooperation between the WHO Western Pacific and Southeast Asia regions with the quadripartite partners is something that we are very proud of. And we are very committed to support all of you towards making our region the healthiest and the safest. I wish everybody a very productive webinar. Thank you very much. And back to you, Dr. Mogo. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Dr. Ronel Abila, sub-regional representative for Southeast Asia, World Organization for Animal Health, formerly known as OIE, Bangkok. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gongal. Uh, distinguished participants from Asia and the Pacific, a uh, pleasant good morning, good afternoon. And to my colleagues from the quadripartite who had just spoken uh, previously, a uh, pleasant good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. 
It is my pleasure and honor on behalf of the WUA uh, and in the behalf of our Director General, Dr. Monique Elwa, and the Regional Representative, Dr. Hirofumi Kugita, uh, for me to represent in this uh, opening ceremony of the Zoonotic Influenza webinar. As we all know, influenza can be transmitted between humans and other uh, other species of, uh, of uh, animals, poultry, pigs, wildlife, and also contamination of the environment, as mentioned also by my other colleagues. Therefore, zoonotic influenza continues as a critical issue that requires action from the quadripartite partners. Systemic in surveillance, collaborative uh, uh, cooperation, laboratory capacity building, timely reporting, early warning and interventions are all uh, critical issues that we must undertake at the country, regional, and at the global level. Despite of all the efforts we have conducted previously, uh, it's been a continuing uh, problem due to the mutating nature of the virus. So Nautic Pluvenza continue to pose a big threat to human, animal, wildlife, and environment. The World Organization for Animal Health has been working for quite some time on the uh, influenza uh, globally, and many of these initiatives have been implemented at the global, regional, and country level, either by ourselves or with uh, collaboration with partners. In the coming general session, uh, avian influenza is one of the major technical topics uh, that we will be discussing its importance due to its uh, impact to production and most importantly because of its zoonetic importance. We have also in our website an avian influenza portal that we regularly update and contains our uh, dynamic avian influenza global report that you can access. We have also the wildlife risk management portal that provide guidance to workers dealing with wildlife and among other resources. At the global, regional, and country levels, the World Organization for Animal Health Program on the Performance of Veterinary Services Pathway, or the PBS Pathway, and other capacity building activities are ongoing to support vet services on strengthening governance. It is also collaborating with WHO FA1 unit in the implementation of the IHR PBS National Bridging Workshop to strengthen capacities of the human, animal, and environment sectors. The public-private partnership is another key area that WUA is working on, which is one of the critical factors for strengthening veterinary services to combat outbreak. Furthermore, a zoonotic influenza is one of the diseases prioritized in our region by the tripartite. WUA is working with FAO, WHO, and UNEP, as well as the other uh, political organization in our region, such as ASEAN, SARC, and SPC, for developing a strategy and implementation, implementation plan to prevent future epidemics or pandemic. Zoonotic influenza is a significant threat, as we all know, to human, animal, and wildlife environment. The One Health approach is a crucial strategy to mitigate the risk of this disease. And the One Health Joint Plan of Action, which was recently launched last year, provides a roadmap for implementing this approach. As we continue our efforts to prevent and control zoonotic influenza, we must maintain a collaborative and interdisciplinary approach working together to protect the health of human, animals, and the environment. I would like to thank all the speakers and panelists and the Quadras Partied subgroup on zoonotic influenza and all the participants for your presence today and for your active participation. I wish you all a successful uh, discussion. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Gongan. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, I would like to thank all uh, quadripartite partners for delivering opening remarks. And now I would like to request uh, Jessica from uh, WHO WIPRO to uh, provide us overview of the webinar and objectives. Thank you very much, Gongo. Um, I believe we have a PowerPoint uh, to present. <clears throat> um, 
There we go. So thanks everybody. Thanks for the contributions and thanks to all the quadripartite partners. Um, to brief uh, all the participants on the webinar itself, um, I believe we can uh, move to the next slide. And the next one, please. Um, so uh, S, can you come back for the first one? Yes, there we go. So uh, as we all touched on the point of zoonotic influenza and uh, bringing uh, a very good point for it that at least 61% of all human pathogens are um, zoonotic and they are representing also a very high percentage of all emerging pathogens during the past decade. And uh, we can see that there are many different species that can be involved in the transmission of influenza viruses, in which we would be uh, discussing a little bit more to throughout the webinar uh, during the next two days. Next one. Um, as we have already introduced ourselves, uh, our regional quadripartite in Asia Pacific uh, has been collaborating over the past years and uh, through uh, official uh, coordination and also official um, um, agreements, um, but basically chairing the secretariat uh, every two years. And this year, our secretariat is with WHO Sierra, but um, overall coordinating the activities here in the region. And uh, the next slide, please. Um, bringing also uh, to the spotlight uh, the One Health Joint Plan of Action. Uh, as you are aware now, we are uh, identified as quadripartite with the uh, UNEP joining uh, the, the team. But also uh, the quadripartite has recently launched the One Health Joint Plan of Action uh, in 2022. And the One Health Joint Plan of Action uh, is composed by six different action tracks. And the six different action tracks are somehow touching in very uh, important and relevant thematic areas, but uh, we can correlate them to zoonotic influenza, at least in uh, four different ones, uh, but giving highlights and uh, bringing attention to all the efforts towards zoonotic diseases and also uh, emerging zoonotic uh, diseases and pandemics. Um, but also putting into uh, importance the multi-sector collaboration and coordination among sectors to address that. If we can move to the next slide, we will be then uh, giving an overview of how the Asia-Pacific quadripartite is coordinating towards different thematic areas. One of them, as you can see, is zoonotic influenza, in which we are uh, often coordinating on the activities, joint events, and uh, joint actions in the region. And that's the same applied, uh, the same mechanism applied to the other technical working groups and uh, subgroups that we have in our region. Um, moving towards the webinar objectives, um, the and the next slide, please. So uh, the objectives of the webinar are basically to promote information exchange and interaction between the sectors uh, towards zoonotic influenza activities, and also uh, putting uh, in highlight the One Health approach. It's also uh, of our interest to reinforce the importance of the multi-sector coordination and collaboration, and um, to achieve optimal national coordination amongst partners and agencies through strategic communications. If we move, Towards the next slide, uh, just an overview of the two days that we are going to have uh, today on session number one uh, with the opening, and then uh, moving towards global and regional actions uh, from the regional uh, from the quadripartite partners and specific sessions approaching control strategies, surveillance, and vaccination, uh, experience sharing from countries uh, towards zoonotic influenza surveillance and uh, good practice in disease outbreak management. So that's a, a very brief overview of the upcoming two days and what we have prepared for this webinar. Thank you very much and back to you, Gongo. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now we are uh, going to start uh, session two, global and regional actions and situations in zoonotic influenza 
I would like to request Makiko Yashiro from UNEP to chair this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Gongo. Um, so my name is Makiko Yashiro, and I'm with the UN Environment Programs Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. And it is my pleasure to moderate this session. And in session two, we will be highlighting global and regional actions and situation related to zoonotic influenza. And we'll have three presentations highlighting first the global and regional situation on human health, followed by a presentation focused on global and regional situation in animal health. And that is going to be followed by a presentation highlighting the global and regional trends on environmental health. So now um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jessica Kayamuri Lopez from WHO. Um, Jessica is um, already mentioned, but technical officer for food safety and zoonotic diseases at WHO Regional Office for the Western Pacific. And she has extensive experience with international organizations in various regions, including Asia Pacific, Americas, Africa, and Europe. And currently she is in charge of One Health and Quadripartite Coordination and is involved in emergency support and coordination to animal and human health incidents. She's a doctor in veterinary medicine and holds PhD in antimicrobial use in animal productions and antimicrobial resistance and master's degree in One Health. So with this introduction, I'd like to hand over to Jessica to present on the global and regional situation in human health. Thank you very much, Makiko. And uh, well, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, from the WHO side, uh, we would like to bring a little bit more about the WHO initiatives related to zoonotic influenza, um, give a brief on the global scenario of human cases uh, relate, uh, of zoonotic influenza, and also uh, bring our regional scenarios and perspectives. So if we can move ahead with the presentation or the next slide. Uh, basically, a couple of global WHO contributions to zoonotic influenza. I won't enter in details, but uh, we have quite uh, uh, a few initiatives that contribute directly or indirectly to the work uh, being done around zoonotic influenza. And uh, these are uh, quite a range of scientific advisory groups, uh, including novel pathogens. Uh, the Emergency WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, uh, based in Berlin, also supporting prediction, prevention and detection, preparedness and response for health threats. Uh, the One Health Quadripartite, which we already mentioned uh, before, and uh, the One Health Initiative uh, bringing up the uh, One Health High-Level Expert Panel that is uh, often addressing um, our uh, needs towards um, the uh, disease outbreaks, including uh, zoonotic influenza. So if we move to the next slide. Um, now, a little bit more specific in uh, influenza uh, program. Uh, so basically WHO hosts uh, global influenza surveillance and response system. And this is comprised of different influenza laboratories, uh, reference centers, and uh, collaborative centers uh, supporting actions on global human influenza surveillance. And uh, also the pandemic influenza preparedness framework that is also assisting in uh, influenza actions, especially in uh, the surveillance systems and also bringing uh, a lot of support to early warning and contributing to the monitoring and surveillance of uh, influenza uh, worldwide. Um, if we move uh, to the next slide, giving a little bit of uh, the actions that we ha currently have in Asia Pacific region, uh, not only the Asia Pacific strategy for emerging diseases and public health emergencies, uh, which is supporting many different actions, including uh, international health regulations, uh, health security and uh, zoonotic diseases, but uh, also promoting uh, methodologies for risk assessment and assisting decision-making and response uh, to a disease outbreak. 
Um, further to that, uh, as already mentioned, uh, the IHR, the International Health Regulations, but more specific to our regions, a couple of the actions that are related to traditional food markets that include zoonotic diseases and other respiratory diseases in which zoonotic influenza is very important uh, and uh, bringing aspects on risk mitigation measures to improve the practices in this uh, type of facilities um, and also uh, touching on surveillance and uh, other actions of this type of uh, pathogens in the, in the, in the markets. Uh, further to that, other specific activities such as uh, publications um, in Wipro specifically, we do have the Western Pacific Surveillance and Response Journal in which many of the uh, reports, case studies, outbreaks and research are uh, often addressed, workshops, uh, trainings, and uh, as also mentioned by Dr. Ronald in the opening remarks, a couple of the activities uh, with the quadripartite joint activities such as the uh, IHR PBS National Breeding Workshop, which can also be addressing zoonotic influenza. Uh, so if we move to the next slide, that's uh, an overview of um, human infections with zoonotic influenza A viruses over the past 10 years. And uh, I believe that most um, of that uh, is uh, related to avian influenza, but we are also putting into highlight swine flu uh, cases that uh, we often have in our region. So from the public health perspective, not only the even influenza subtypes are of relevance, but also the swine uh, influenza subtypes that are affecting human health. And uh, as you can see, this is a longstanding surveillance action uh, and monitoring uh, type of activities. Um, and um, all the coordinated efforts are amongst available networks, programs, and also counterparts, including information sharing and joint risk assessments. So if we move to the next slide, um, which is basically over the past, uh, from 2020 to 2023, on the incidence uh, of cases of zoonotic influenza A viruses. Um, at this point in time, we still do not have evidence of sustained human-to-human -human transmission of zoonotic influenza. However, uh, we continue insisting on the vigilance for novel influenza viruses, uh, or even uh, uh, already known influenza viruses of pandemic potential. So uh, this is a very critical action from our end and uh, it's uh, way important. Um, as uh, we already, uh, ex we have been experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic response, uh, the influenza cases certs uh, would potentially pose a pressure on the healthcare system, uh, especially to address all the needs of patients uh, experiencing not only the COVID-19, but other respiratory diseases. However, uh, from another side, uh, the impacts on the detection and surveillance of respiratory illnesses uh, could be observed. So uh, a, a potential increase on di diagnostic capacity and awareness for respiratory illness etiology amongst, human, amongst the human health system uh, could be observed. Um, if we move to the next slide and we will have a... Uh, um, uh, an idea of the cases of influenza A viruses subtypes in Asia Pacific region uh, comprising uh, the Western and Pacific and Southeast Asia. And basically we can see um, that most of it uh, is related to avian influenza, but we also had cases of H1N1, which is uh, swine uh, influenza. Um, different outbreaks uh, in different um, countries, but uh, well, knowing that our region, it's uh, prone to various health hazards um, and uh, we, we still see a lot of actions towards uh, zoonotic influenza in the region and the monitoring of that, it's very important uh, on a long-term basis. Um, and if I may close the presentation uh, and bring uh, some take home messages, um, we do, uh, have uh, a very uh, 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 an understanding of uh, human infections being caused by new influenza subtypes, and all of them are being reported under the IHR 2005. 
um, human infections with zoonotic influenza, they can they are primarily acquired through direct contact with infected animals or contaminated environments. And that's where we also bring traditional food markets or live animal markets into the spotlight to uh, reinforce activities in these uh, facilities. Um, the global surveillance for zoonotic influenza and global monitoring of variant uh, influenza viruses are still um, of great importance for the work being done uh, uh, by the WHO, in which we uh, will continue to stress that importance to uh, member states to continue strengthening their routine surveillance activities. And uh, for um, the coordination and collaboration, uh, especially by using the One Health approach, uh, and I believe our colleagues uh, from the quadripartite will also be strengthening it uh, through all the uh, discussions that we are going to be having uh, during this webinar, but putting multi-sector collaboration at country level as a crucial move for us to move uh, towards the reduction of zoonotic influenza viruses spread um, and uh, to reduce also uh, potential risks coming from uh, from that. Um, I will close here and uh, I will head that back to you, Makiko. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Jessica, for your comprehensive presentation and providing an overview of the global and regional trends and highlighting various existing initiatives in the human health sector and WHO's contribution to those initiatives. Um, so now we would like to move to the next presentation and it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Shantani Buranathai from WOA to present on the global and regional situation in animal health. And Dr. Buranathai is one health coordinator at the WOA sub-regional representation for Southeast Asia since 2022. And she's a doctor of veterinary medicine from Chulalongkorn University and holds PhD in microbiology from the University of Iowa College of Medicine. And she's a veterinary expert and has extensive experience in handling emerging and exotic diseases and has held various positions at the Department of Livestock De Development of Thailand, including the Director General for the policy team. She joined the OIE Regional Representation for Asia and the Pacific in Tokyo in 2011, working as a regional coordinator for a global transboundary animal disease framework. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Shantani for her presentation. Uh, thank you, Makiko. Uh, allow me to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see it? Yes, so, uh, yes. Okay, we go. Uh, good morning. My uh, presentation is uh, only for uh, avian influenza situation. It's global avian influenza situation in animal health based on what is our war uh, information reporting system. Okay, the, um, the outline will be global AI situation in poultry and in non-poultry. Also the avian influenza report in mammals and a new our new initiative AI dashboard for Asia Pacific. For first of all, I think we have to understand poultry and non-poultry. This is not based on the biologic. This is for the sake of reporting. Poultry means all birds rare in, or kept in captivity for production, commercial animal products, or breeding for this purpose, fighting cock and other use purpose, and all bird used for restocking supply. Okay, for breeding or game. This is a this is a poultry. But birds that are kept in a single household. Uh, no um, commercial value and not not never leave the place. This is non poultry. This is based on the WOA definition. Okay, and another non poultry is the bird that kept in captivity for other reason, uh, like keep it for show, for racing exhibition in the zoo. This is this is considered as 
non poetry okay okay now this is the uh, situation we start the year okay we start the year in the with 290 outbreak okay mainly in europe and also in americas asia and africa uh, a larger number of outbreak compared to last year's wave at the same time outbreak are also spreading further to central and south america country the first occurrence of uh, hpai in panama honduras Venezuela and the recurrent in Chile after 20 years of absence. That is a, a really high peak at the beginning of, of the year. Okay. Then, uh, sorry, back a little bit. Okay. Then the over 10 million birds died or were caught worldwide during the five week period. Uh, the predominant subtype at this time is still um, H5 um, and mainly H, subtype H5N1, okay. Uh, in January, in January, Ecuador reported its first case of human transmission of avian influenza. Uh, the case of a nine year old girl living in a rural area was in repeated and close contact with backyard poultry. This is the first reported case of human infection caused by avian influenza A, which is a H5 virus in Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, this is the, in the next period, continue with uh, 70 outbreaks in Europe, mainly in Europe but also in the Americas and Asia, also spreading further to Central America countries as well. This is the, also the report of first occurrence of HPAI in Costa Rica in non-poultry birds. Okay. During this period, over 3 million birds died or were called worldwide. And a predominant subtype is still a subtype H5N1. Now, coming up, we are not at the peak yet. This is on the, during February. There are new 30, 37 outbreak in Europe and Americas and Asia, and also Central America countries. That we, it is worth had to highlight that the first occurrence of HPAI poultry in Bolivia and the first occurrence of HPAI in non poultry bird in Cuba and Ecuador. During this period, around 2.5 million poultry birds were die or call worldwide during only three weeks. Okay. The, the next period continue with 44 outbreak, mainly in Europe and also in the America and Asia. And the spreading is further in America, in America countries. The first occurrence of HPAI in poultry in, in Argentina, and the first occurrence of HPAI in non poultry in Uruguay. Um, there also the report of HPAI in Memo in Chile and France. This is like this is show that the virus the virus the virus has spilled over to mem mammalian host. During this time, 2.2 million poultry birds died or were called worldwide, and it's still uh, H5N1. In the, on 23rd of February, Cambodia reported one confirmed case of human infection with avian influenza. H5N1. Then this, the next day after that, another case, a second case with a, a family contact to the first case were reported. Uh, these are the first two human cases in, of avian influenza H5N1 reported from Cambodia since 2000, 
14, 10 years back. Okay. Um, now, now uh, the peak is coming up low from the seasonal pattern. There are 48 new outbreaks, okay? mainly in Europe and also in America and Asia. During this time, 1.5 million poultry dies or called. The first occurrence of HPAI in non-poultry in, in, in Gambia and also uh, show that the disease is still spreading to a new area. Although the, the low, the older area has kind of uh, declined, but they're spreading to new areas. Uh, this is another important uh, piece of information during this time. Uh, People Republic of China report one confirmed case of human infection with uh, H3N8. This is the third reported case of human infection with an uh, H, H, this uh, subtype. Okay. Now uh, we, we will the report on non-poultry. Okay. Non-poultry is um, in short, maybe non-commercial um, value of, of, of poultry. Uh, at the beginning of the year, 140 new cases in non-poultry in America, Europe, and Asia, and no new case in Africa. And the subtype is H5 or H H5 or H5N1. The, for the second period, 90 new cases in Americas and Europe, and no new case in Afri Africa and Asia, still H5, subtype H5N1. 120 new cases in America, Asia, Europe, still H5 or H5N1. In in Chile now, the in Chile and in Colombia, it is uh clay 2.3.4.4B 2, 2 lineage, which is a resource man duration and North America in both uh, Chile and uh, Colombia, and this time no new outbreak reported in ongoing event or ongoing events is mean by starting to decline during this period. Okay. Anyway, the three weeks after 120 new cases found in Africa, Europe, UK, there UK reported H5N1 in marine mammal. Intense South American bush dogs, five uh, gray seals, and one harbor porpoise, and two common dolphins. Uh, 33 now, you know, is uh, according to the epidemic pattern now, is going down. 33 cases only in Europe, no new event or ongoing cases in Africa, Asia. America and uh, Oceania. Okay. Now the I like to discuss avian influenza in mammals. Okay. Um, see, this is in our website as statement of avian influenza and in in mammal. You you can learn about this on the our website. And uh, for the member will report on influenza in memo based on like the, in the two article. In article 1.1.3, maybe the, the maybe uh, reported of a new cases or new or um, species or unusual host species. And article 1.15 is like the volunteer report. Okay, like this one, based on 1.13, there's a report in the mammal in Belgium, Chile, and then the, again, in, in many, many mammalians. This is voluntary report from the country, and thank you for that. From, from UK, uh, in many, many mammals, like fox, 
Brazil, dolphin, other from Chile, from Peru, in the lion, a sea lion, and mink from Spain. Okay. And most of them are like H5 in one. This is a you know, house, this animal look. This is a new species reported um, in this year, 2023. And this one is like, uh, voluntary report, okay. And uh, the last topic that I would like to introduce is the our new, uh, what a new initiative, which is the AI dashboard for Asia and Pacific. This is underdeveloped, but I like to show you how it will look like, okay. Uh, for this one, with the with the dashboard, it will show the outbreak in the Asia Pacific, okay. You can uh, separate it by country and total outbreak and really poultry and wild bird. And if you click on the another tab, it will show the strain of the virus, which is the main subtype reporting. Okay, and, and, and from the country as well. And also another one show the temperature Temperature graph of the of the outbreak. So, uh, for the WHO recommendation, uh, for what are recommendation, uh, World Organization of Animal Health recommend the country to maintain to maintain their surveillance efforts by all security measures at farm level and continue timely reporting of avian influenza outbreaks in both poultry and non-poultry species. WOA also stressed the importance of reporting outbreak of avian influenza in unusual host, as it has been noted that the virus has been increasingly detected in mammals in recent months, a situation that should be monitored. High quality of information is key to support early detection and rapid response to potential threats to both animal and public health. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Magiko. Thank you very much, Anthony, for your um, very informative presentation and really providing an overview of the global situation on avian influenza and also highlighting regional trends from animal health sector perspectives. Um, so now we will move to the next presentation. And it is my pleasure to invite Ms. Marion Strucker from UNEP to present on the global and regional situation in environmental health. And Marion is an expert consultant on One Health at UNEP Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. And she's been working with UNEP since 2019 as a biodiversity specialist on various ecosystem management initiatives. And before joining UNEP, she worked as international cooperation manager of the National Nature Trust Korea in Seoul. And prior to that, she was engaged in the fellowship program on international affairs of the German government and worked with the Research Institute on Biodiversity of Plants in Germany. And Marion holds a master's degree in biomechanics from the University of Cambridge and bachelor's degree in biomimetics and bioinspiration from the University of Applied Sciences, Bremen. So with this introduction, um, now I'd like to hand over to Marion for her presentation. Thank you so much, Makiko. Um, matching to the topic, I actually have called a call, so please bear with me today. Um, I really hope that my voice is clear enough for the whole <laughs> presentation. Okay, so after these brilliant presentations from my quadripartite colleagues, um, already giving the context of zoonotic influenza with also the numbers and cases reported, I will talk briefly um, about the global and regional situation in environmental health in context um, to uh, zoonotic influenza. So next slide, please. And I want to start my presentation with setting the scene for the environment. And today, um, the Earth is facing a triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss, and pollution. And this really touches upon all areas of our life. 
um, you know, human civilization is depending entirely on the um, ecosystem services, the silent ecosystem services that nature provides. So from our economies, lifestyles and well-being to the bare necessities for our survival. So fresh water, clean air and daily food. And of course, health. We're really depending on ecosystems and we have not taken good care of our home. Um, we are now using the equivalent of 1.6 Earths to maintain um, our current way of life. And uh, simply ecosystems cannot keep up with the demand. So as the UN um, Secretary General states, making peace with nature is the defining task of the coming decades. And we must seize the opportunity presented by the COVID-19 crisis to accelerate change. Next slide, please. Now, looking at the um, Asia Pacific region, um, we are really one of the most diverse regions in terms of um, biodiversity, but also uh, social and cultural diversity, as we have 36 of global biodiversity hotspots, uh, sorry, 17 of the 36 global biodiversity hotspots and seven of the 17 mega diverse countries. But on the other side, we also have um, 4.5 billion inhabitants and a very fast urbanization rate. So changing landscape from rural to urban setting. Um, and in other words, wildlife and people are very close to each other. And as we disrupt nature and change the balance of nature, this is also where um, yeah, a lot of viruses and diseases come from and have their origin. Next slide, please. If we look at the status of biodiversity in the region, it also does not look good. Um, so we can see that vertebrate uh, population declined by 45% in the last decades. And um, right now, globally, 25% of species in assessed animal and plant groups are threatened with extinction. So it's one quarter of all the assessed animal and plant groups that are um, threatened by extinction. Um, and all major ecosystems also are threatened. So a major drivers of this biodiversity loss are the unsustainable economic development um, and land use change. Um, then on the other side, agricultural intensification and the extensive use of agrochemicals and the overexploitation of natural resources and deforestation. So this is to set the scene. Next slide. Um, as we heard from our previous speakers, zoonotic influenza is caused by animal influenza viruses. And in one health context, I think this graphic is used um, many times to also explain the origin of zoonotic diseases. And it shows um, the spillover of zoonotic diseases directly from wildlife um, or livestock to people, and also the amplification effect in domestic animals. Um, now, next slide. Now, if you look, on the same effect from the um, ecosystem perspective, actually viruses have also an ecological function. Um, so in an intact and healthy ecosystem, viruses have actually an, an effect on the inv individual. So from the individual organism, um, as you can see in the graphic, um, over changes in population, community level changes, for example, predator-prey interaction up to the ecosystem level. And this um, host parasite interaction is very complicated. And you must imagine this is driven by millions of years of co-evolution. And actually that can increase the genetic diversity of both hosts and pathogens. Um, and in a functioning and healthy ecosystem, this is a balanced co-evolution. I just want to highlight that. However, this is not a one way street. And if you click once more, please, then um, as you have seen from the slides before, we are actually massively degrading our ecosystems in the region and destroying the habitats of wildlife through land use change. So we don't have this balance anymore. And this will impact biodiversity on the other levels. For example, predator prey interaction, the population size, and then which in turn will drive the emergence of vector borne diseases like zoonotic influenza. Um, and we just uh, heard from Dr. Chantani that, you know, even in mammals, maybe we can now find avian influenza. So basically, the takeaway from this slide is whatever happens to biodiversity will also affect our life. And I think um, Marlene uh, in her opening speech also said when we destroy and degrade biodiversity, we really undermine the web of life that we depend on as humans and really increase the risk for disease spillover from wildlife to people. Next slide. 
Um, now, if you're interested in this topic more, I can recommend you these two reports. One is the UNEP report on preventing the next pandemic, and the other is the IPBIS review on biodiversity and pandemics. And both really highlight um, that declines in nature have contributed uh, significantly to the crossover of diseases. And actually also conservation should be considered in the One Health approach really as a prevention measure. Next slide, please. Now I want to come uh, and bring this all in the context of zoonotic influenza. Um, you know, in this IPBIS report, it was stated that land use change has caused the emergence of more than 30% of new diseases reported since 1960. And this also has an effect on the emergence of zoonotic influenza, because as we change the, especially the biodiverse landscapes in the region, and also convert it to agriculture or urban environments, there is less space for migratory birds really to find uh, food and rest on their journeys. And especially the location of large scale uh, poultry operations within these migratory bird flyways pose a risk as maybe there is like um, open access to watering and feeding areas, or there's waste runoff from livestock to the open environment. And this really brings wild birds in close contact with livestock and really providing the new pathways for pathogens to spill over. And um, studies have shown that especially the loss of wetlands um, in our region, we have a lot of uh, conversion from wetlands to agriculture, for example, rice paddies. Uh, they have had a huge impact and studies really suggest the protection of wetlands could be a key strategy to reduce the spread of avian influenza. So by protecting and restoring wetlands, um, we would create a more natural habitat. And this would um, create more space and food for wild birds and migratory birds and really reduce the need for the migratory birds to share the habitat with livestock. OK, next slide, please. Um, now, another important factor I want to bring in is climate change. Um, and we are really living in a global world where everything is connected. Here um, on this on this map, you can see the major migratory bird flyways on our planet. And I just wanted to show you, you know, there's no way. And climate change, as we know, change um, increases the disease emergence and cross species transmission risks on the one side. Um, but also it will cause major shifts of the migratory patterns of wildlife. And it will also have an impact on host and vector life cycles. So if you think about the ecological levels that I've shown you before, um, climate change is an abiotic factor and it will really affect all of the levels um, from ecosystems up to the individual. Um, I think we know in our daily life that climate change is already and will continue to affect our lives. And this also um, will affect health. And I just want to say that climate change mitigation and adaptation is also very important for health and in the context of One Health. Okay, next slide, please, thank you. So uh, just to summarize the action points from the environment sector regarding the prevention of zoonotic influenza, there are basically five key action points. We have to prevent the further degradation and land use change of landscapes, especially, especially along wild bird migration routes in the region. Then we have to prioritize um, conservation and restoration, especially of wetlands, as, as shown before. Um, we have to systematically reduce adverse agricultural practices. For example, these large scale intensive livestock farming, especially near protected areas. And then fourth, we have to um, combat illegal wildlife trade, which is also a major factor actually in the region uh, for the spread um, through wet markets, as Jessica said also before. And this is also a major factor. And also, um, last but not least, addressing climate change, pollution. For example, in this region, um, if you think about air pollution and the effect on respiratory um, diseases, right? So air pollution is also a major thing, um, as well as other drivers of biodiversity loss, for example, invasive species. Um, and I, this is really just to show you um, five key points. Um, and actually, if you look at them, the environmental sector has been covering many of these points already. But maybe the focus is not 
how to say, under one health, but another focus in the environment sector. Next slide, please. So in my last minute, I just want to highlight um, one example where we are working to this, towards this already. And uh, we are in the UN decade of ecosystem restoration. Um, and this is a call um, which is led jointly by UNEP and FAO to stop, prevent and reverse the degradation of all ecosystems with um, flagship initiatives around the world. And this is just one of the many movements um, that also has a lot of benefits to health but when we are working in silos, maybe we are not aware of it. And this is exactly where we need the One Health approach. For example, with this um, ex uh, example, we also need to think when we talk about restoration, um, about, for example, health considerations um, for from maybe uh, an increased human life, so wildlife contact, right? So there is there needs to be this exchange and multi-sectoral approach. And then uh, next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to show, I wanted to end my presentation by showing you the multilateral environmental agreements, MEAs. Um, this is to show you just that the environment sector is very much engaged uh, already on the topics that are relevant to the prevention of zoonotic influenza and zoonotic diseases. So for example, we have the CBD Convention on Biological Diversity. And uh, we just have um, adopted a new global biodiversity framework where One Health is already actually reflected. Um, but there is more, like uh, CITES Convention on International Trade uh, in Endangered Species, as we said, illegal wildlife trade, um, CMS, so Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species, Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. I'm just reading the names, but you can see that the topics are very much related and essential for the prevention of zoonotic influenza, as we have established before. Um, what is missing is maybe the lack of awareness, both from medical community, environmental sector, um, that you know we are working towards this already. And it's, of course, I, on the other side, also mentioning Convention on Climate, um, UNEA, IPBES, IPCC, these are all very important. And I hope that through One Health and the quadripartite work that we do like today in this webinar, we can really increase the awareness and make more connections uh, because there are many synergies and co-benefits of working together if we really consider the environmental side as part of the solution. So with this, I would like to come to close uh, to, to my last slide. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I think we could talk about this even further, but today, you know, we have to also keep <laughs> track of the time. So thank you very much. And back to Makiko. Yeah, thank you very much, Marion, for your um, informative presentation and really providing an overview of the global and regional situation in environment health. And I think you highlighted um, that there is a need for us to recognize the close connections between the health of environment, wildlife and animals and humans, and also the need to scale up various existing initiatives for protecting environment, particularly in the context of the upstream prevention of zoonotic influenza. So thank you very much. And uh, this brings us to the end of session two. And once again, I would like to thank all our speakers for their very informative presentations, which have um, provided us with an important overview and background for the rest of the meeting. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to hand over to the next chair of the session, Dr. Philip Kles from FAO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Makiko. So after all this epidemiological overview and seeing how UNEP and others are also getting involved in the One Health uh, strategies for avian influenza, we move to session three, which is about control strategies for avian influenza. And we will have two distinguished uh, keynote presentations, the first one by Dr. Yoshi and the second one by Dr. Hualan. And then hopefully after that, we will have a little bit of a panel discussion of uh, all the things that are being brought up during these two discussions. 
I think we, in terms of control strategies today, we will focus on surveillance and vaccination. We will not touch yet upon biosecurity measures, but maybe that might come up in the panel discussions if we have any time for that. So first I'll start with uh, Dr. Yoshi Sakoda from Japan. If we can have, do we have his bio up as well or else I'll just uh, tell who he is. <laughs> So Dr. Yoshi works yeah. at Hokkaido University, and he's also the WOA reference laboratory for HPEI in, uh, in Japan. So Dr. Yoshi, the floor is yours. Over. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a moment. I'm now, uh, sh I want to share my slide, but uh, Philip, could you I, stop? I, uh, yeah, uh, Jim, can you stop? I think Dr. Yoshi wants to... Uh, Thank you. From his side. Okay. Yes, it looks like it's going now. Okay. Okay, Yoshi, all yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Yoshi Sakoda. So today I will uh, talk about maybe our same look like a country report. What happened uh, in our country in these two, three years? Maybe that is a good uh, uh, information to sharing for the, this title. Uh, first of all, so in terms of the H5 hypers viruses, so uh, in my in our uh, opinion, so the most important is uh, surveillance in the birds, including the uh, poultry and also wild birds, should be conducted, and then especially the <laughs> as a voluntary works accompanying uh, mammals should be examined at the laboratory. So and that kind of uh, uh, intensive activity must be very important for the future pandemic preparedness. And another point is uh, when we th think about uh, unexpected things like uh, wild mammalian infections, the Ministry of Environment in, in the country level, Ministry of Environment is very important and how the, the expert like me will, con will do the risk this risk assessment discussion before the something occur. Uh, fortunately, I'm the chair of the uh, ABI Influenza section of the Ministry of Environment Japan. So we have uh, many discussion before uh, we will find uh, the Fox uh, case of we infected with H5N1. And also the virus and the sequence information sharing to other laboratories, another important point. So this is a fact of what happened in this winter. Unfortunately, we are still fighting in Hokkaido. So the, this is a national record of the domestic poultry farm. So 17 million uh, cases in the 84 outbreaks. And the world was, this is also a national record of more than 200. And in addition to that, the captive birds, including three big famous zoo, uh, we have an outbreak. And uh, for that kind of uh, uh, passive and uh, intensive analysis, the most important, maybe each country have our each national reference laboratory. And in Japan, we have a National, national Institute of Animal Health, especially for the poultry, and also National Institute of Environmental Studies, that is mainly for the uh, wild birds. And to support uh, these two national institutes, including my uh, university, three universities are supporting mainly for the World Wars uh, intensive surveillance. And uh, the reason of these three laboratories in Hokkaido and, uh, and Totori and Kagoshima is related to the migration route of the World Wars from the continent, the Eurasian continent, because one is from the Russia to Hokkaido, north part. Another one is directly China uh, across the uh, uh, Japan Sea. And uh, another one is uh, by a uh, Korean peninsula. So in, in Sapporo and uh, Totori and Kagoshima, we are supporting uh, the early warning of the infections in the wild birds. So wild bird surveillance is the base of the monitoring of the viruses and the early warning and also the detection of the mammals. And uh, I will explain and introduce a little bit about uh, my university. So my university is 
located in the center area of uh, Sapporo. Sapporo is a uh, two million citizens. And uh, our university have a uh, two big campus, in, uh, one big campus and a botanical garden. And uh, this is my office. And last week we have a very good sakura uh, blooming in cherry blossom. And uh, from my office in the winter season, so this is a uh, uh, Christmas Eve. So from my office, the snowing and so many crows, as you can see. Um, so this is a Christmas uh, night, but I'm fighting against the H5. Maybe the crows are waiting the present from Santa Claus. But uh, what is a real situation in our university, not in Sapporo City, in our campus is last winter, uh, season finished the middle of uh, uh, May. And uh, we did the uh, intensive uh, surveillance of the dead crows, jungle crows, uh, from the summer season to the, the autumn and the present. And we firstly detected the viruses at uh, the October, middle of uh, end of October. But this uh, dot line is a reporting line to the Ministry of uh, Environment. That means uh, this, these small outbreaks in the crows is uh, under the iceberg. So <laughs> to understand the ecology of the viruses, so the, even the Ministry of Environment decide that uh, more than five is a reporting line. We should check everything intensively. And uh, so as a result of that kind of intensive surveillance, we detected uh, the mammalian cases in, in maybe that is uh, uh, the only one case in Far East Asia uh, from of H5 virus infection in the uh, mammarians. So this winter again, and last winter, we detected the viruses from the uh, fox and also the, from the tanuki. So, and uh, all of, most of them is uh, meningoencephalitis after the virus infection in the respiratory organs. And these viruses, are, as you expect easily, so these viruses are classified into 2344B and uh, three subgroups were invaded in Japan. We did a full genome sequence and already released uh, sequence data to the public. And uh, fortunately, so our uh, two mammalian detections, all of uh, most of the, the amino acid uh, mutations that was reports uh, the that is important for the adaptation to the mammarians, uh, still the just the avian type and uh, all of all of them are the the same like a uh, crow and also other raptors. But uh, the viral passages in the wildlife is a uh, very problematic. Uh, it, when I uh, fighting in Hokkaido because we can find the. Uh, so wild birds to the resident birds infection and the fox, the mammal will bite and eating the crows and the dead uh, fox. So the crows will bite again. <laughs> so it, maybe it is hard to control 100% of wildlife, but we had better monitor the, the situations as much as possible. And uh, so during the, that kind of intensive surveillance, we will uh, isolate the virus and the whole genome sequence and the virus and also the sequence information sharing as much as possible for the, maybe for the development of the new diagnosis method or the new the development of the vaccine and the others. So I explained in the first slide the, the most important point, I will go back. Yeah, most important point, in terms of the H5 cases, the world virus surveillance in, uh, is very important and uh, accompanying uh, mammal cases, we should check carefully in these uh, reference laboratories. And the uh, Ministry of Environment is uh, very important in our experience and uh, how we will share the virus and the sequence information to the others is very important as a contribution of our war reference laboratory. That's all. I will hand over microphone to Philip. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Yoshi. And please do not run away because I might need you for the panel discussion afterwards as well. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> but very nice and very nice to see also the interaction with the mammals and the wild wildlife. So we will bring that up again during the panel discussion as well. So now next, I would like to introduce Dr. Huolan Chen from Harbin Veterinary Research Institute in China. She's the director of the National Animal Influenza Reference Lab of China, but also an FAO and OIE reference center for avian influenza. Of course, she does a lot of research so studying on influenza viruses, development of vaccines, and also over 200 publications now, I think, in many, many high-level peer-reviewed journals. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Hualan to give her presentation. Over. OK. Thank you, Philip. I will share my slides. Um, so can you see that? Yes, we see your slides. Can you put them in presentation mode, Dr. Willem? Yes. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm very happy to be invited for this meeting to, to give this talk. I actually, I sent an email to Dr. To Philip yesterday. I asked what people expect from my talk. And uh, he suggests uh, vaccination would be a uh, interesting topic. So I prepared these slides just to give you an interview about how we control the H5 influenza and H7 and 9 hypersodemic influenza in China by vaccination. And I hope people can learn from our experience and uh, can have a good practice to control the global hypersodemic uh, influenza now. Uh, you know, China is a large country and we have huge numbers of domestic poultry. And um, the official number is 17 billion, including 4 billion ducks. And the, most of the ducks are reared uh, in open field like this. So they share water with white birds and whatever white birds carry, they can spread to those waterfalls. <clears throat> um, about the influenza, every influenza control strategies. We know that many countries in Europe and North America, they use, used to control hypersodemic influenza by culling infected and the suspected poultry. But China is the leading country to control highly pathogenic avian influenza by vaccination strategy. Um, people talk a lot because influenza virus mutants easily and the mutation occurred in the HA can often cause epigenic variation which compromise the protective efficacy of the vaccine. So, <clears throat> It is important to make sure that the vaccine matches the circulating virus. Actually, this is a big challenge for implementing the vaccination strategy. So to this end, we continuously perform active surveillance in white birds and the domestic poultry to monitor the newly introduced virus. In our laboratory, we collect over 14,000 samples per year. And we, we compared the ethogenic properties of the newly detected H5 virus with the vaccine seed virus. If a clear difference is observed, we will think about to update the vaccine. We have developed a platform for rapid generation of the vaccine vaccine seed virus. With this platform, we can, per, we can generate an ideal vaccine seed virus within a week. <clears throat> China is a large country. Of course, a large number of migratory birds fly over our country. 
and they introduced the different H5 viruses into China in the past years. And we have reported all those things, or most of those things in different journals. <clears throat> and uh, viruses carry different colliders or subcolliders of the HA that have been introduced into China before 2020. From this table, you can see in 2005, that's the very famous clade 2.2 virus was carried by bar-headed bar goose <clears throat> from other countries to Qinghai Lake. And then from there, the virus was spread to other places and also uh, several other subtypes or uh, cladders. And uh, we have developed a series of vaccine seed viruses to target those newly introduced uh, viruses. And uh, before 2020, there are eight different vaccine seed viruses that were used. From this slide, you can see each vaccine targeted to a specific clader of virus. And uh, by using these vaccines, <clears throat> several of the cladders have been eliminated. Uh, before 2020, we actually only have this virus that carry the clader 2344H HA gene in China, in the, mainly in the Lao poultry market. So <clears throat> at that time, we used the H5RE11 vaccine and also a H5R12 vaccine targeted to this collator virus, but that one was not detected, but the vaccine was still used at that time. So since 2020, H5 viruses bury the collator 2344B HA gene have caused numerous outbreaks around the world since, and, and this slide shows the numbers of the outbreaks that occurred in poultry and new wild birds caused by H5N8 and H5N1. I think we all know that the H5N8 caused the first uh, huge number of outbreaks and then it was replaced by the H5N1 virus in October, 2020. <clears throat> so I'm not going to tell you all the story. I'm, I'm sure you, you have heard or you have read the papers from different groups. <clears throat> I just want to tell you that when we saw the outbreaks occurred in European countries, in other countries, so we started to pay high attention for the surveillance. So from <clears throat> um, I think, uh, yes, from September 2020 to June 2021, in half year or more than half years, we collected uh, over 14,000 samples from wild birds and the domestic poultry. From this, uh, we try to isolate H5N8 virus. And you can see from over 25,000 samples we collected from chickens, we did not get any H5 virus. <clears throat> but from 300, 17 wild bird samples, we got 22 H5N8 viruses. And these wild bird viruses were definitely transmitted to the open field ducks and the geese. So we got eight viruses from ducks and the six viruses from geese. And we performed very detailed studies of those H5N8 viruses. And we found they actually were divided into belong to different groups. And we found one group of the virus was came from uh, came to uh, China and carried to China by Upper Swan. And the virus was originally found in European country in the domestic poultry and the wild birds. So from this place to China, it took about one year. And another group, we call that group branch two virus, that was also carried to China by Upos one. We detect that in October 2020, but the virus earlier time, it, the virus was detected in 
May 2020 Iraq in the domestic poultry. We know that the H5N8 virus, when they're circulating in nature, they're continuously combined with other viruses, resulted with other viruses and the form of different subtypes of the strains. <clears throat> Here, I just want to point out the famous H5N1 virus. This virus got the HA genes from the H5N8 virus and uh, other genes from other low subtypes of uh, low pathogenic viruses. And the virus was generated in the wild birds in Netherlands, in the Netherlands. <clears throat> and then this virus started to cause disease outbreaks in domestic poultry and the wild birds in European countries and the two other spread to Africa, um, Asia, and the North America. And they formed 16 different genotypes. Genotypes means the internal genes and the NA genes are different, but the HA genes are still from the H5N8 virus. So that's the collector 2344B. And among those 16 different genotypes, four genotypes were detected in China. And we also know those viruses were from like the, the from different countries, the G7 and the GYs from you know. European country directly and the, the, the G10 from Russia and the G7 from Japan or North Korea from the small places. And we also have a G9 virus, which might be generated in China. So when we got those H5N8 virus, we analyzed their epigenetic take properties with the vaccine stream we used at that time. And we saw very clear difference in the HA titus. So we were really worried about that, the domestic poultry in our poultry farms. So we <coughs> tried to answer this question because at that time, our poultry were vaccinated with the old vaccines. So we, get the routinely vaccinated poultry, uh, chickens and ducks, and also unvaccinated ducks from local farms. We transformed them to the laboratory and we performed the challenge study with this H5N8 highly pathogenic virus. And we found that the vaccinated chickens were perfectly protected. When the virus was put in the SF, SPF chickens, the birds were killed very quickly. And all the birds in before day three shed high type of viruses. But the vaccinated chickens from the farm were completely protected. No bird shed any virus. All of them stay healthy. And uh, the ducks that were vaccinated with one dose or two dose were all completely protected. But the unvaccinated ducks, 20%, uh, two of the 10 ducks died, eight of them survived. But all of the ducks shared very, shared very high tide uh, viruses. So that means the H5N8 virus in the field, that, that may not kill those ducks because the dosage will be much lower than the, the dosage we used, we used in the laboratory for the challenge. So this kind of cross protection explained why <clears throat> from January 2020 to March, over 194 billion poultry died or were destroyed during the H5 virus infection, but only less than 10,000 birds were lost in China. Because we saw the clear epigenetic variation, so even though the, vac the old vaccine can still provide good protection to this newly emerging H5N8 virus, we still updated the vaccine. And the currently the H5RE14 vaccine is targeted to this 
CLAD2344B two, three, four, four virus. And uh, currently we are using uh, H5H7 vaccine with three vaccine strains, two H5 and one H7 to protect our poultry in China. And we have performed extensive studies and we proved those vaccines can, can protect both, um, not only chickens, but also ducks and the geese from the globally circulating H5 and the H7 virus challenge. I will uh, use a few minutes to tell you our experience about the, the H7 and 9 virus control. We all know that the H7 and 9 virus emerged in China in 2013, and it caused the five human infection waves. And in each of the waves, <clears throat> people don't eat uh, poultry or poultry products because, you know, our government just uh, tell people, the media tell people stay away from poultry products. Uh, so each year, tons of the uninfected poultry need to be destroyed. And uh, such kind of practice caused uh, considerable damage to poultry industry in China. And in 2007, in early 2007, the H7N9 low pathogenic virus mutated to highly pathogenic form. And uh, it caused uh, several outbreaks, disease outbreaks in their chicken farms. And uh, several millions of the birds were destroyed to control the outbreaks. So in September 2027, the control strategy of h 7 and 9 influenza virus was changed from stamping out to massive vaccination. And uh, H5 and H7 bivalent vaccine was started to be used to control both H5 and H7 avian influenza in China. And uh, <clears throat> after the vaccine was used, and we performed the uh, uh, surveillance before that and after the vaccine was used, and we saw that the isolation rate of H7 and 9 virus in poultry was immediately reduced by 93.3% <clears throat> after the vaccine was introduced. And uh, also the vaccination of poultry successfully eliminated the human infections with H7 and 9 virus. From this slide, you can clearly see that after the vaccine was used, we have only three or four cases. And started from this time, in more than three years, we don't have any human H7 and 9 cases. So our experience tells us that vaccination strategy is very successful in China, as evidenced by the fact that several clusters of H5 viruses have been eradicated and the Pervasive H7 and 9 viruses have been nearly eliminated. Given that the H5 viruses are widely circulating in wild birds and causing problems in domestic poultry around the world, I think vaccination should be immediately and seriously considered as a control strategy globally. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Hualan. This was very interesting to see how some big countries are very much effective with using vaccination as a strategy for control of, of AI. So I think, and I hope you can also still hang on for like another 20 minutes or half an hour, if that's possible, together with Yoshi. Because okay, it's, yeah, I'm out. Because it's, we're now going to basically have a little bit of a panel discussion, but my panelists from Indonesia and India seem not to be online, so I have to go for plan B, which is okay. I like to improvise a little bit. So I have Dr. Hualan, I have Yoshi, let me see on my screen. I also have Eric from Institut Pasteur in Cambodia, who also does a lot of surveillance and so on. So hi, Eric, thanks for being here. Uh, that's a surprise, mm -hmm. but I know 
is is prepared and i don't know maybe jessica from who so we also have the the, the uh let's say the health sector present and anyone from UNEP, makiko would you like to join or would you say no and we're, we're good enough so maybe basically what i let's start with this panel and based on on yoshi's and, and dr hualan's uh presentation uh in terms of let, let's talk a little bit about surveillance and then afterwards on, on vaccination. What I see is that both countries, both China and Japan, they really say in terms of early warning, it's very important to look at the wild birds and also what we see sometimes in other countries like Korea, they first see wild bird outbreaks and then it moves into the, the poultry systems. But my question both to Yoshi, Hualan and maybe also to Eric is like, uh, how do you practically deal with active surveillance in wild birds as it can be like very costly and very difficult to get those birds? And what do you see as potential alter, and also Eric, in terms of potential alternatives still to get the data from wild birds to, but to get like a better coverage or a more cost-effective surveillance in wild birds? As this also came up during the global consultation last week, as Europe is dealing with a lot of wild birds as well. So maybe Dr. Yoshi first, and then Hualan, and then Eric. Yeah, thank you very much. So as far as I understand about the pathogenicity of the recent H5 viruses in the wild birds, uh, the, some of the species of crow uh, have a very high pathogenicity for this H5. So we can detect easily the viruses from the resident birds like crow or raptors. On the other hand, maybe as you know, so that these viruses already the miles or moderate pathogenicity to the migrating ducks. So it is hard to find uh, 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 dead ducks in the migrating site. So if we can find a good, like a, a scavenger or a good uh, wild birds, passive surveillance still effective, but I don't know the future. <laughs> but five, mm -hmm. ten years later, crows never die, same like a wild ducks. So we should do, uh, shift the intensive surveillance again. As a conclusion, so we can find some of the dead birds. So passive surveillance is still effective in our cases. Even we could not detect the viruses from the international flight like a tax. Over to Philip. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. So mainly passive surveillance in Japan and um, not much active surveillance or very high low success rates, or is that correct? Is yeah, that as a as a in researcher of the university, we are still conducting the active surveillance from the uh, virus detection from the fecal samples. As I indicated, so there are three migrating routes to Japan, not from the north, from the continent, and from Korean Peninsula. So that kind of university conducting, but uh, in the national level, the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Environment, they are now the negative impression to spend the budget or uh, the time for that kind of intensive surveillance. So that is the law of the university and uh, maybe national government shifting for the uh, passive surveillance. Over to Philip, thank you. Thanks, Yoshi. So it's like also the importance of getting the academics on board as well. Dr. Hualam, how is it done in China in terms of wild birds? Yeah, as you mentioned, say that it, it, it really costs a lot to collect samples from wild birds. So we just try to, I mean, for my laboratory, we just try to figure out the several points that the migratory, the first stop of the migratory wild birds when they fly from other places to China, they will first stop to there, in their area, that area. So we figure out a few such kind of places and we send the people there to collect uh, samples. You know, if we happen to see dead birds, we definitely will collect the dead birds. Otherwise, we will collect the fresh drops. And okay. for the virus isolation, actually, those 
wild birds carried a lot of different things. We learned a lot. If it's not highly pathogenic, there will definitely carry low pathogenic strains. Yeah, it, it, it costs a lot. Yes. And any active capturing of birds or not really? That's mainly also fecal samples and dead birds. No, no. I, I actually, like um, the Hoover store in 2020, we saw dead birds. Yeah. Also, wild ducks, those two species always carry those highly pathogenic strains. Thank you, Dr. Valan. I'll go to Eric first, and then I see Marion raised her hand from UNEP. So, Eric, how is it done in Cambodia, or any suggestions as well? Right. So, um, I agree with uh, Dr. Valan and, and Dr. Yoshi that um, you know active surveillance is quite expensive, um, and and it not all does not always give you all the data that you need. Um, so, passive surveillance, especially for dead or dying birds is um, conducted here in Cambodia when we have outbreaks and, and things like that. Um, but we do try to do active surveillance. Um, I think that in order to have a successful early warning system, um, we really need to have longitudinal active surveillance. Um, and, and that's really critical for our information. Um, there are ways, um, you know, obviously constant improvement is necessary and there are new innovations and technologies that allow us to expand our surveillance at the environmental interface, whether that's water surveillance, air surveillance, things like that. We'll talk about it more, I think, tomorrow. Uh, but also, as, as have been, has been mentioned uh, by Huelan and, and Yoshi, targeting certain species or targeting certain high-risk areas is also a way to reduce cost and really get information that you need quickly. Thanks, Eric. Marion, I see you raised your hand, so please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I thought maybe I could just come in and um, give a little bit of experience from the environmental side, because I think we have, as, as just said, um, surveillance is expensive, and I think it would be good to really um, rely also on the environmental sector and, and work together. But um, data gaps is a huge issue if you look from the environment side. So uh, <laughs> if you think about, I think the number that we just said, 25% of the, the, the assessed species um, in the world are threatened. And we actually, IUCN is monitoring only around, well, it depends on the, on the estimation, but 1% of all species in the world. So there's a huge data gap and how we try, I think, to, 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 to gap this in the environment sector is, um, maybe also working with means of citizen science. And maybe this could also help in the case of, of health considerations. That was one um, example I wanted to give. Um, but I also wanted to put everything a little bit in perspective because I think um, Dr. Hulan just mentioned that there are estimated of 17 billion poultry uh, in, in China, right? And just to bring this in perspective, there are around 3,000 red crowned uh, cranes still in the wild. So <laughs> there used to be 10, 000, no, no, millions, actually millions of the cranes, and now we only have 3,000 left. And this is maybe also, um, yeah, one of the causes that is really driving the emergence of new, new uh, viruses. And I also wanted to say that not all wildlife is equally affected by um, influenza, avian influenza or zoonotic influenza. Some of the, the, the birds seem to be more affected than others. Others are more like uh, hosts that are spreading. And uh, I think this factor is still not, I mean, there's so much data missing that we really need to work together from um, in the One Health approach uh, with environmental sector and health sector to really get to, to close this data gap and even maybe with the means of citizen science. Thank you, Marion. And I don't know, Jessica, any requests or recommendations or suggestions from WHO side in terms of wild birds and passive, active, or environmental surveillance? Thanks, Philip. Uh, I believe that from our end, uh, it would be interesting to uh, also for uh, reference and also how to understand a little bit more overall how this uh, coordination is done for the specific activities at national level. Um, and it would be very interesting to hear from our speakers on their uh, 
ongoing multi-sector collaboration uh, and also the sectors that are involved at their level uh, to coordinate or to implement uh, activities, especially for surveillance purposes, um, maybe touching a little bit on information sharing and also coordination of efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. So I, a question maybe to Yoshi and Dr. Hualan, how the, let's say, the coordination is done with the ministries of health in your, and Eric maybe as well, in ministries of health or ministry environment in terms of uh, coordination of the surveillance at these interfaces. And I see at the moment also Dr. Nagarajan from India also joined. <laughs> so good to see you again. So basically, we started the panel okay. talking a little bit on surveillance. I will have one or two questions on surveillance, and yeah. then we will move over to uh, vaccination strategies. So now the question was in terms of surveillance, how is it coordinated between AC and, and MOH? And then I'll go uh, to Hualan, Yoshi, then Nagarajan, if how this is done in India, and maybe Eric for Cambodia. So Dr. Hualan. Um, we and the public health Side, we have regular meetings to share information. So whenever there is a, something, you know, new cases of human infections, they will inform us immediately. And so we will check out the, the, the samples we collected from that area and tell them what was there in the poultry. Yeah. Thank you, Wala. Yoshi, how is the interaction with health site in Japan? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm the chairperson of the Ministry of Environment, especially the Avian Influenza Project. So every time we are inviting the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, both. So the, also the, the chair is the Ministry of Environment. So we are sitting together every time for all of that information sharing and the discussion. But uh, these two, three years, the the interest uh, from the Ministry of Health side are changing, as you know, because the situation is uh, changing dramatically. So th that is a so even before the the crisis. So how we will sit together, talk together, say like foreign. That may be important point. Over. Thank you, Yoshi, and maybe quickly introduce Dr. Nagarajan. I think. He's from the UWA Reference Laboratory in Bhopal, if I'm still correct. That's the last yeah, time I right. checked, right? Yeah, that's so, right. <laughs> with Dr. Tosh. So well, welcome, Dr. Nagarajan. Uh, and I know it's like in India, there's quite always outbreaks reported in wild crows, et cetera. And then we have some sometimes some poultry outbreaks. But then also, how does this data get shared with the Ministry of Health or how is the coordination done in India? Over. Um, actually, this uh, coordination between uh, Ministry of Health and uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, that is actually the Department of Animal Husbandry and Dairy, which is actually the nodal agency for animal health, and the, uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, which is the uh, health side. We already have a uh, joint action plan, which mandates that uh, uh, the exchange of the data during the outbreaks. And also, we have two programs uh, running... Uh, in India, one is IDSP and another is the NADRAS. And again, uh, there is an inter-coordination uh, meeting like uh, National uh, Committee for Zoonosis is there in which both the uh, ministries actually, along with Ministry of Environment, they share the outbreak details as well as the control data. And uh, so to ensure the, the close coordination. So whenever there is an outbreak uh, in uh, animal side, we actually distraction notified to Ministry of Health as a routine practice. And the uh, joint surveillance of the uh, human surveillance is carried out and uh, around the area and also the post-operative surveillance for the animal uh, animal side is being carried out for control measures. Thank you, doctor. And I know, Eric, you have recently had the, some of the latest human cases of H5N1 as well in Cambodia, I think. So maybe it would be nice to hear from the Cambodia experience as well. Over. Sure. So all of our... All of our um, Active surveillance is, is done in, in very, very close coordination with the animal health sector, um, usually run by the animal health sector. And then now, especially with wild bird poultry interfaces, um, Ministry of Environment is, is also highly involved, um, oftentimes because we are doing things like sampling water and other environmental samples in protected areas. 
which are um, critical to the Ministry of Environment's um, uh, purview. In terms of human uh, response, we do work very, very closely with the Ministry of Health. Um, if there is a suspected case of avian influenza or a, or a confirmed case, uh, there is a joint One Health action plan that should be followed. Uh, that includes uh, One Health style investigations that do, does include Ministry of Health uh, Cambodian CDC, Ministry of Agriculture, um, and a number of other partners that, that will go out and assess the situation and, and respond. So it's quite well coordinated um, uh, in terms of what happens in, in terms of an AIV case. Um, but now we are integrating Ministry of Health more and more into our active surveillance so they can actually look at people that are surrounding these poultry farms and markets and, and things like that to um, help understand any risk of spillover as well. Over. Thanks, Eric. So I want to ask two more questions in terms of surveillance and then maybe go a little bit on the vaccination before we close. So we've heard a lot now about wild birds, uh, domestic poultry uh, surveillance, and a little bit on the, on the mammalian side with also passive surveillance. What I would like to ask also uh, for Yoshi and, and the others is like uh, in your countries, how has the government of course gone to everything is like, how is the interaction with either private sector or cooperatives in terms of their surveillance data or, or getting data from, from private sector agents in, in the country? How does that work if, if any of those are done for all the panelists basically? So Yoshi? It's like, is there any farm data or private sector data that flows into the system as well? Yeah, so private sector means including a poultry farm? Yes, the poultry farmers and so on. Yeah, or the, yeah. the big industries. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so in terms of the poultry, uh, we, we are not so big uh, issue or because we're organized well. But in terms of the wildlife animals, so we should uh, collaborate uh, more, especially for the mammalians, because there are many NGO uh, members to save the like mammalian, the, the seal in, in the sea, and also uh, the layer raptors. So we should collaborate with that kind of NGO members. First of all, we should announce the, the importance of the infection of the, that kind of uh, mammalian and wild birds because animal to human infection that, that must be the very dangerous the occasion of the an avian to human uh, mammalian to human infection in, a, in other point is uh, how we will make a good connection to report their sample to the government and also the different national reference laboratory to sharing the sample so <laughs> there are so many cases uh, in the like uh, ngo Oh, Professor Sakoda, there are many uh, foxes in the freezer of last season like that. And uh, when we checked, several sample is positive. So how we will make a good connection that timely is a big challenge for us. Oba. Thanks, Yoshi. That maybe also brings up the swine sector, etc. So maybe Hualan. I know also in China, there's the big swine sector. And, and as we knew, H1N1 was the previous pandemic, which everybody forgot about already, but that actually was swine origin. So Hulan, in terms in China, interaction either with private sector or with like, let's say non-avian sectors as well, how does that, uh, how is that coordinated over? Uh, I think that that was then sent post to our laboratory because we are the national reference laboratory for influenza, avian influenza, and uh, animal influenza. Yeah. So also swine samples get to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. Is Actually, I have a big group. They, they also perform very active surveillance in pigs. OK. Yeah. And all that data gets collated in Harbin, basically, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. And in India, Dr. Nagarajan, in terms of private working with private sector, poultry, or, or other sectors? How is this? Is this also organized by Bhopal or by the government? You're still muted. So you'll have to unmute yourself. Right, fine. Uh, basically, in India, private sectors, they don't do uh, any surveillance for avian influenza per se. 
uh, it is actually done by uh, the Bhopal Laboratory as well as our institute as well as the six uh, regional disease diagnostic laboratories. And uh, that data is, coll uh, is collected or is actually uh, compiled at the level of the ministry. So this is the basic uh, structure which is for India at least. So here we don't have any private sector uh, uh, like um, any surveillance carried out by the private sector at all. So okay. we don't have any data on that on that basis. Thanks. Eric, any comments from your side in terms of other people that we're missing out where we can get better data coverage? Um, no, I, I do think that contribution from the private sector is absolutely critical. I, I personally don't have um, input from the private sector here, but um, I, I know that people like to work together here in Cambodia and the region as well. Over. Thanks. So. My next question is going to be, we talked about HPI already. How about low path surveillance? Because I still think that's basically the precursor of, of most of the high paths. We all know that. We all know our biology, I guess. So, and I know Dr. Yoshi has been talking or doing a lot of that uh, with WOA in terms of H9 surveillance, et cetera. So maybe a little bit of like your experiences at your country levels in terms of uh, low path H9 or other H6s or other types of low path surveillance, how that's organized and could contribute to better prevention and control. Dr. Yoshi. Yeah, thank you. So as far as I know, in these 20 years in Japan, we have a no low, low LPAIV infection in poultry, no H8, no H7, no H9, even H5, H6, nothing. This is true. We are doing the ELISA test, uh, but uh, no antibody is completely free. But so we are speculating that uh, we can easily get the viruses from the wild birds or the smuggling meat. So that kind of surveillance activity we are conducting intensively. But so far, fortunately, we have uh, no issue of H9N2. So we should listen carefully about the story of China or other countries uh, every year. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi. Dr. Hualan, low path in China and how is it monitored? Uh, you, you know, you, when we do the active surveillance, we collect sw swaps from different birds and we put the swaps in eggs. So everything can grow. I mean, if it's in the virus, if it can grow in eggs. So we got a lot of low pathogenic virus, different subtypes. Of course, in China, the H9N2 is the most prevalent stress. And we can get that from low poultry markets, from the samples we collected from low poultry markets. And we can also get the virus sometimes from the samples we collect from poultry farm. Yeah, H9 into is a really a uh, uh, very popular one. And uh, also last year we got, uh, I mean, the numbers of H3N8 increased dramatically and we found it's uh, new resultants. The viruses got the HA and N8 genes from different white birds, but the internal genes were from the H9 into, it seems that kind of resultant or generated in the low poultry markets. And we have a paper pub submitted to your surveillance and it has been accepted for several, I think months, but still it was not online. Yeah, that is a you know, very important paper. People can learn a lot of information and also other subtypes, but like H11, H10, it just come and go. We can get that from the Dark samples in the low poultry markets, not not so many in, from the chicken samples. Thanks. And in, in terms of vaccination for low pot, is there any regulatory framework? Well, or, or, you, you know, or we just focus on the highly pathogenic vaccines, but we have, I mean, in China, we have different H9 and 2 vaccines, but it's all combined with other kind of disease, poultry disease. So I don't think the vaccine works very well, the H9 and 2. So that, that's a problem. Yeah. 
maybe would it need be to... worthwhile to look at that as well maybe as an additional one i don't know if, if there is the farmers are interested or not or whether this is something we should maybe also contemplate in the future because the virus you know the h9n2 virus alone does not kill any birds so yes. the government uh, really don't pay too much attention we all okay. always you know talk about that <clears throat> but okay. i also have a question for yoshi i saw i heard at least the uh, I mean, I mean, presentations from different scientists in Japan that isolated the different subtypes of avian influenza viruses from your birds, but you say that you don't have that one. The law has a identical virus. Virus mean wild birds? No, no, no. I mean, domestic poultry. I, mm. I, I don't remember the name of the scientist, but I invited her to Harbin and uh, she gave a very good presentation about the surveillance and I saw different subtype of the influenza virus in your domestic poultry but you said you don't have. Okay. Okay. So, so, so do you do active surveillance in uh, domestic yeah. poultry? So, so when, when Professor Kida was a very active, he ordered the serological surveillance in the Agagel, Agagel first and now Eliza and still completely negative against but you, all. you don't do virus yeah, isolate. Yeah, because uh, no, <laughs> no antibody positive means uh, no silent spread of the virus. Of course, we are conducting the swab sampling and uh, active surveillance using chicken embryo. And uh, maybe some of the report that uh, H9N2 viruses isolated from the domestic chicken or ducks is only the international poultry. International, sorry, international airport. No, no, I, I, I mean, she presented from different poultry farms, but I think that's that's normal. That's that's very normal situation. But you said no, I don't know why. Okay, that just yeah, that yeah, okay. To, to be continued <laughs> on H nine in China, we to be continued. Let's okay. hear from let's hear from India in terms of low path screening and low path surveillance. If there's anything going on in India, yeah, actually uh, we have an action plan, national action plan for uh, surveillance of avian influenza, which are in, which is mainly for low pathogenic avian influenza, and H9N2, uh, like uh, China, it is a major, uh, it's endemic in India, and recently government of India has approved a vaccine vaccination program for the H9N2 control. And we are planning to initiate uh, specifically uh, a surveillance program directed towards h 2 uh, to monitor the efficacy of these vaccinations. Thank you. And do you know which type of H9s are used, Dr. Nagarajan? Is it like I'm local strains? Or... Yeah. yeah, it's a local strain. It's a local strain, which is uh, actually evaluated by us. And uh, it was found suitable to cover uh, the at least uh, whatever the strains circulating within the West Asia or we can say uh, Western uh, G1 lineage. So that's it, that's it. Okay, thanks. Because I've seen earlier, like some of the H9 in industry, like European companies, they have used like really very old strains, which are not updated like for 10 years or so, but it seems they still have like a good, or they claim to have a good coverage. But uh, I always wonder whether we need a little bit better looking into those H9 and 2 vaccines to see whether they're really updated and what really the value is. So if, if India is doing this, this is really good, I think, and, and that's something that we can discuss at global. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, what you're saying is right. I agree with you. Uh, like uh, what we have done is uh, to um, validate uh, the vaccine candidate vaccine strain with uh, H9 and 2 viruses isolated over a period of 20 years. and. Uh, if uh, some uh, other companies which have developed like international companies which wanted to uh, test and give their vaccines at uh, market their vaccines in India, they can do a vaccine matching testing. And then uh, if that is okay, then they can uh, approach the government of India for the same. Thank you, Dr. Eric, any quick question or like update on low path surveillance in Cambodia as I know you're doing a lot actually. So. Yeah, so all of our all of our samples, as soon as they're M gene positive, go straight into full genome sequencing. Um, so we skip a lot of testing um, because 
it's actually quite cheap to do full genome on, on adequate viral loads these days, um, but we do put them all in eggs as well. Um, we monitor a lot of things besides H5. Um, so uh, things like H9, H7, uh, but we also detect things like H10, H6, H3, um, H14 <laughs> sometimes. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I think um, that data needs to be correlated a little bit better to understand um, circulation as well um, overall. Also, um, you know, we're working on, of course, integrating multiplex testing for subtyping um, as well. Uh, which can help to reduce cost and, and time uh, in addition to um, other testing. Over. Thanks, Eric. And I know you're going to talk tomorrow about all these things as well. So for those who are online now, tune in tomorrow for Eric's talk on uh, his work in Cambodia. So let's let's move gear now. And I see we have about eight minutes left, I think. So let's talk a little bit about vaccination and Maybe first question, which I would like to ask to Yoshi, Nagarajan, and, and Eric, or maybe others. I know Nagarajan wasn't present, but uh, basically Huolan showed the efficacy or the effectiveness of like full-blown government H5 vaccination in China, really driving down the infections while noting that we know still Japan, India are not vaccinating. Also Europe, USA is not vaccinating, but given the changes in EPI and last week in, in the global consultation in Rome, there's really more a global drive towards at least emergency vaccination, if not vaccination in Europe and the US and, and, all, and even Latin America as well. So what are your ideas or stance on this Yushi, Yoshi and Nagarajan? You think it's something that could be considered or you think of course, it might be a more political decision above your head, but as a scientist, let's say, what would you think about, like, uh, can it still be controlled without, or is it something that we should be put on the table globally or not? Yoshi and then uh, Nagarja. Yeah, may I start? So sure. I, I think that is depending on the, the policy, the political yeah. point, and also the what kind of avian species are the main, the poultry in each country? In the case of China or other Southeast Asian countries, they have so much ducks. So generally, it is hard to find the clinical sign, even without vaccination. But in our case, 99% of the poultry is chicken. We don't eat duck <laughs> originally. So uh, our policy is still, if the, H5 virus could not kill the uh, chickens. Maybe we should reconsider that kind of things because early warning without vaccination could not work well. But so far, our government must keep uh, the general uh, uh, policy. But uh, as a scientist, I want to listen carefully what is uh, recent, uh, the recent the, the wave or the general session in the OIE. But uh, when I talk with uh, so, so the private sector, the most biggest point is uh, human resource for the vaccination itself. The oil mm -hmm. adjuvant vaccine, it is hard for the in Japan. So how we can so develop the good, the, like a recombinant based vaccine for the like a chicken embryo or something, maybe that if there are no that kind of good vaccine, it is hard for to the uh, feasible wa continuous vaccination in Japan. That is a discussion if we will dis start a vaccine. Over. Thank you, Yoshi. How about India? Yeah, um, actually right now we are, India is uh, not vaccinating. The, it basically depends, what I personally feel is that uh, uh, it should be based on the economic as well as the uh, zoonotic uh, infections which is happening in, uh, in the country that should decide uh, drive the policy for vaccination. And uh, Arias rightly pointed out by Dr. Uh, Yoshi that it is also a political administrative decision about the vaccination. But personally, what I feel is the infections in India are so sporadic, like it doesn't, uh, in, uh, it doesn't occur in the same place at the, every year or uh, on a regular basis that it warrants a vac targeted vaccine for a particular region to control an outbreak. Because if you're getting an infection and then after uh, around 10 years, 
if the infection reappears it may be a sporadic infection or a re, or a introduction of a disease so that doesn't this kind of a case doesn't merit uh, uh, a vaccination per se in the poultry rather it requires an intensive surveillance and control but in case of an uh, out, larger outbreaks which actually uh, is going to seriously affect the economy of the poultry industry then i think uh, india may uh, consider for that thank you thank you um and I know, Dr. Luohuolan, I didn't ask the question to you because I know China is vaccinating, but maybe a more technical question to you looking at the data in terms of ducks. Well, because it seems like, I don't, first of all, which species of ducks, whether this were mallards or other, when you do the, the, the trials <laughs> and, and what, sorry? You mean because the challenge study? The challenge duck, I saw the picture. So which, which type of ducks, it's the small ones or the big ones? <laughs> Um, actually, I cannot tell you too much. We have many kinds of ducks. Yeah, yeah. And just, just a, just a technical question because I see it seems people always say like in terms of feasibility or like it's always difficult to vaccinate ducks and there is like different results in literature. So, can you say like it, what would it, be the it's best? It's not way? difficult. It's not. It's not difficult to vaccinate ducks. Just because many virus, hypersodenic virus, they can kill chickens, but they don't kill ducks. So the 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 duck owners they don't want to vaccinate ducks to against the H5 virus. That's the major reason. So we recently developed a, a bivalent vaccine, use a duck enterogenous virus as a vector because duck enterogenous virus can kill ducks very quickly. So people use that love attenuated vaccine. See, we, we put the HA gene into that virus. So that one vaccine can provide protection against the two different uh, disease. Yeah. Thank you, Holland, because that was actually my next question. It's like, where are we with the bivalent DEV? Is it being used already <laughs> no. or is it still in the experimental stage? <laughs> It, it, it takes very long time, too long time for China to, to approve this novel vaccine. But it's in the last step, very okay. soon, will be approved Good. very soon. Yeah. We spoke about this five, six, seven years ago, I think. And that's why I just, this yeah. was my follow-up question. So good to know that the DEV is coming. So I see we still, uh, we're at the end of uh, the panel and I see we just have Dr. Chantani and Marion from UNEP and WOA still also there if they would have any questions as our partner organizations to our esteemed panelists, uh, looking at Chantani or Marion, it's because you're on camera, I wasn't sure whether you had a question to our experts or not. If not, just say no, that's good as well. <laughs> Chantani? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Philip, to give me a chance to, uh, to speak on behalf of, like, well, I just, a uh, general comment that, uh, to, what are, to this year, we have uh, at the general session that we have a theme, AI, which is a big theme for this year. So hope that like it's also available online. So if any in our audience would like to listen to what has been discussed at a global level, and vaccine definitely will be discussed there too. And by the way, Thailand still not using vaccines since uh, 2004. And um, I was invited to speak to one country about vaccination. I, I just comment that you would invite a wrong person because I'm in the, <laughs> um, during that time, I was the one who, who worked with the government and, and showed all the evidence. And the reason we don't use uh, AI vaccine because the, the cause of the to surveillance after vaccine costs like seven times higher than the vaccination itself. So that is why the government just say no, we, they, they're willing to pay for stamping out and things then. I, I think I showed that uh, calculation before, what is the trigger point when we think we should vaccinate and how much we have to spend. And that costs like seven times more than just like keeps them out. Thank you. Okay, so, okay yeah, there's an economic trade-off between compensation 
versus vaccination, post-vaccination and exit strategy, basically. That's what you are telling me. Uh, Marion, any questions? Well, <laughs> well, also maybe just a general com comment, just to reiterate that, you know, um, conservation should be also considered as a prevention measure. And in regarding to surveillance, I think there's also a lot that we could do to facilitate better coordination between health and environment sector. And um, it's good to hear also from uh, Dr. Sakoda, where it seems in Japan that's already working quite good. And as he also stated, I think uh, a lot of opportunity to work with NGOs, um, because there's a lot of um, really citizens that go uh, go out and do monitoring for various species and like really trying to work together with the NGOs also and, and uh, you know, civil societies. I think that would be also a great benefit in doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. And with that, I think I already took a lot of Dr. Yoshi's and Dr. Hualahan's time and asking them to stay on and Nagarajan and also Eric last minute to be him on the panel. So with that, I would really like to thank our two speakers and our panelists for the uh, panel discussion now and hand it back to our chair, I think back to Gunal, uh, back to Gongal, I think to close day one. So Gongal, hand it back to you, over. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was a great opportunity for all of us to listen from Center of Excellence, that is WA, Collaborating Center for uh, Reference Laboratory for Avian uh, Influenza in China, Japan, and India. And also Hokkaido University is our WHO Collaborating Center for Zoonotic Diseases. And uh, it, it is a great opportunity for all of us to update what is going on uh, in uh, epidemiology and evolution of avian influenza viruses. Yes, poultry vaccination, uh, definitely it is a very uh, difficult uh, issue. Uh, many countries they have introduced, many countries they are not introduced. Uh, it has trade implication. And also uh, yes, nine yon two uh, avian influenza, yes, nine yon two vaccine. That has been traditionally used for decades. And now, now we are also detecting human cases. Uh, that is a concern for all of us. Uh, and it is very important to provide all those information. And it was great that FAO organized a global surveillance of avian influenza uh, in Rome uh, uh, last week. And it is a great opportunity that World Organization for Animal Health will be discussing this issue. The avian influenza game is not over. And it may come back in different way, but uh, the most important thing, uh, I just want to highlight that China was reporting human cases of avian influenza viruses, even during COVID-19 pandemic, whereas other countries, they have to stop surveillance. So it means uh, uh, not because there are outbreaks, but there is a good surveillance system developed by China, and that's why uh, they are detecting new and new uh, avian influenza viruses and also human cases. So that we have to acknowledge. And uh, we want to see all of you again tomorrow. And it is a great start. And our quadripartite partners, we would like to thank all of you for your active participation and contribution to educate all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you to be part of this event. And see you all tomorrow, I guess. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.